Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. Um, I know it's late afternoon. I won't bore you with you know, more technical stuff because my talk is not going to be technical. But if you are a little bit disappointing about that, I mean, it's time to leave. <laughs> just <laughs> just going to warn you that this is not a technical talk. OK, first of all, who am I and why I'm here today? So I, I am Emma, and I'm from London. Uh, in the UK. It's, it's quite a long way and I'm still in JLAC. Um, I'm a cloud security architect at EPAM and today I'm going to talk about metrics. So um, in this session I'm going to share some techniques and stories about how to identify and establish cloud security metrics and KPIs. So these are the three questions I would like you to maybe keep in mind. Um, by the end of this talk, you can tell me whether this, this talk actually answered those three questions. So the, the, most, you know, the most important question is that I want to ask, why are security important, uh, sorry, why, why are metrics uh, important in a conversation about cloud security? Um, it's often a question that we ignore um, because we are all busy with our own works and it's easy to ignore that. So these are the, uh, the agenda for today. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what we will be covering today. So I will be talking about the challenges we ha all have experienced about metrics as developers and cloud pra practitioners. And then I will move on to some techniques and best practices. I hope they will be useful for you. Um, then I will share some examples of my past projects and where I have adopted those, those techniques um, to, to help my, you know, my clients to establish KPIs. And I, I will wrap up with a, um, a prioritization approach to the vulnerability remediation. Okay, so what is cloud security metrics? Is, um, well, a, a simple Google search uh, give me this definition. Um, a survey by uh, Palo Alto said that by the end of 2024, uh, it's predicted the, the workload in the public cloud will be 60, 64%. So when we talk about cloud security metrics, it's actually covering multiple domains, instant response, um, IAM, and software development, and so on, you name it. So what is the big metric problems? So in my experience of um, with over 20 customers in my career, um, nearly 90% of them have prioritized security metrics. So you know how important it is, but um, you know, the customer that actually take, taken actions to, uh, to get visibility on, of, from the senior management is zero. So most of them are saying that security metrics is important but actually um, it's difficult to achieve that. So here I've, I've outlined some of the top challenges. So firstly, there is a disconnection between security and uh, the business goals. So the board might not see the relevance or the team lacks budgets or resources to handle them. So with the amount of data available uh, from the cloud native tools, metric data can be overwhelming. So even you are able to track the, the metrics, you, you probably have experienced false positive alerts as well. So that is, that's very difficult to, you know, not to generate bad metrics, right? Um, so what we wanted to do is to have the metrics that can also adapt to the, um, the new threat landscape as well. It's, and often we have failed to uh, keep up with that evolving threat landscape. So tracking metrics is not just measuring success and security, and more importantly, it's a tool to communicate uh, security risk to your senior stakeholders. So let's talk about how, why tracking metrics is, is not um, just nice to have, it's an essential task for the business. So without metrics, how can you justify your security budget? So these are the questions you're probably gonna come up with. Things like, you know, you want to track your security posture trends. So at the end of it, it's all down to reducing business risk. So you want to have an informed conversation with your senior stakeholders, right? As a developer, it's difficult 
because you were communicating in different language. So, um, yeah, my talk is, is all around, you know, how to communicate those metrics to your senior stakeholders. Um, so before, um, before we're gonna di uh, deep dive the, um, into the more, you know, uh, less technical but some technical things, uh, let's clear up some confusions around metrics and KPIs. So these terms are used interchangeably. Um, the thing about it is metrics is, is simply measurements. It's a snapshot of what's happening right now. KPIs, on the other hand, um, is used to track your pro progress towards a specific target. Think of them like a fitness tracker. It tells you how close you are to your daily goals. So in, in this example, mean time to remediate, uh, we normally use it as a metric and it's just a number, but by, by saying that we will reduce that, that time by 25% this, this uh, quarter, that is a KPI. So that is the main difference between them. So these are the seven steps that I have provided here, but I'm not gonna drill down into the de details of those steps in this session because we, we are short in time. But the bottom line is, I would recommend to define and follow your own metric framework as the process can be made repeatable. So some of the questions you can throw out there when you are defining your own threat, um, sorry, your <laughs> own metric models. So um, first of all, who to share the metrics with? And sharing the metrics with someone who's technical is very different to sharing with the board and you might end up with creating uh, different dashboards. And you want to make it as an actionable outcome. You want metrics that don't just measure, but also provide you clear insights into where security can be improved. And um, you might also think about the tools that you currently have. Can you collect and track the metrics for your uh, current tool set? Because um, you shouldn't, you sh it sh uh, tracking the metrics shouldn't be um, extra cost, otherwise it wouldn't justify. So at the end of it is the metrics needs to be, needs to have some context. So the story you want to share and tell about your cloud security posture uh, to your senior stakeholders. So these are the things that you want to consider. So how, secu how security posture of your cloud, cloud native environment has been improved over time. So that is what you want to tell them, right? So. Um, how well your security team is performed, how well your, t uh, your developer is working and collaborating with your security team. So those are the questions you want to ask in order to create a full picture of uh, what's going on. So uh, on the page here, I've, um, I've provided some criteria and framework. Um, they might be useful for you. I mean, feel, feel free to explore them. Um, but I'm not gonna recommend things at the moment, but it's just something that I, I found very interesting. So when you are deciding what are the key metrics, there are some criteria you can apply. So these are the tools that can provide you, that you can lo lo look further into to, um, to set up your criteria. Right, so okay, we're gonna talk about how to establish um, the KPIs. There are two approaches. The first one is the top-down approach. So you think about the big picture, the business goals, what is your driver? What do you want to achieve? Is it in increase your company's revenue or is it to improve your customer's satisfaction? Things like that. Then you have this a KPI and then you can look at, you know, what metrics will be identified for achieving that pro, um, for achieving that objectives of the KPI, then you identify what are the measurements needed to uh, establish that uh, metrics. So bottom-up approach is the other way around. It begins with raw data. You're gonna, you know, look at security tools and processes, and you can determine what is the what are the metrics that you want to use. Then the final step is to identify the relationship with, uh, between them and establish the key metrics and KPIs. 
So which one's better? It depends on your organization and uh, the scenarios. So in the ideal situation, it's the combination of two. So this, this is just a, you know, like a, a quote that I like. Um, that I got from SNEAK. Um, there is a research has been conducted by SNEAK to build a uh, metrics model of mapping relationships and inferences between different data elements. So I, I, I would recommend to you to look into that because it provides you the full metric model by using the, uh, the, the casual loop diagram. And the casual loop diagram is something that I need to talk about. So it shows the relationship between the metrics um, and help you to understand the dynamics between them. So it goes beyond by just looking at individual metrics. Explores, it also explores how they can interact and influence each other. So the basic of the casual loop diagram is that you, you've got those nodes. So those nodes are representing a variable, or in this case, it's the metric. And then you've got a plus sign um, indicating a direct relationship and a minus sign indicating a uh, inverse relationship. So now let's take a look at closer at this diagram. Sorry about that if it's too small for you. But the thing that I want to talk about here is, right, um, so look at this. The, the connections between the number of security instance and mean time to detect indicating a balancing loop, which means high instance rate, slow down detection rate, hence increasing your time to detect. This creates a cycle because longer detection rate also leads to more instance so, and so on. I hope this actually you know, gives you some ideas of how the relationship work. Um, just, but just bear in mind the relationship between the metrics might not be similar in different times or situation. So you need to understand those relationship in, uh, of those metrics in your company, in your own situation. Because the thing that I got here is just based on my analysis of my, of my clients. Okay. Um, on this page, I'm going, going to look at how to apply, um, how to apply the casual loop diagram to a uh, infrastructure as code. I think we all know about infrastructure as code. I'm not going to go through the, the, te the you know the technical bit of that, but I've got this diagram. So this diagram shows you the the workflow of a, of a, a typical infrastructure as code. So I got it from the Microsoft Azure. Uh, in Azure um, website, so it's not something that is it's not something new. But um, the purpose of that is I want to explain about how can you bring a workflow into metric, and and then identify the key KPIs from that uh, from that diagram. So in this case, as an infrastructure as code workflow. These are the metrics that I have identified from that workflow. So you've got you know, policy violation rate, um, number of, of a vulnerability fix, and number of vulnerability detected. So what is the, problem? the question is, what is the, key, uh, the, the KPI in this case? So um, you, you can have a look at the diagram. Notice here that the policy violation rate and the average time to remediate, they both have um, multiple incoming loop, but zero outgoing loop, which indicating that they are the perfect candidate for the KPI, because they are the final, um, the final of that diagram. So you, but in this case, you can also extend this diagram by adding more metrics. But for the, for the scope of the current diagram, they are the, the, the best candidate because they are influenced by multiple variables of data relationship, but they are not a direct influencer them, themselves. And they are also quantifiable and measurable. So they are the examples of where you can get uh, establish a, a target to reduce um, to reduce the, the, for example, to reduce the average time to remediate.
Okay, now I'm going to talk about the protection level agreement. So I don't know how many of you have heard about protection level agreement. Um, so initially, it's a, um, a research done by Gartner. Um, so it's used to establish a target for your KPI, for your metric. So essentially, a protection level agreement is an agreement between your security team and the, and the senior stakeholders. So wh why, does it, why does, is it important? It's because you want to know how much protection you want to invest into your into different cloud systems, right? Because in, in, your, in, in your environment, you have different criticality, different type of cloud systems. Some are critical, some are low risk. So you want your stakeholders or your business leaders to understand, to understand how much they spend on, on those to protect those um, cloud systems. So that's a protection level agreement. That, that's, um, that's, yeah, that's why we, we have the protection level agreement. And it's based on the outcome-driven metrics, and it used to balance your business needs and the security requirements. Uh, so this is the five step of how PR, um, the protection level agreement works. I won't dive down into this because we're also short in time. Um, but essentially, you firstly define your goals and then you identify your assets, classify them, then you establish the desired protection for those, uh, for, for those um, uh, cloud assets. Then you map your security controls with those protection level. At the end of it, you use the outcome-driven metrics to establish your KPI. Uh, KPI. Um, so this is an example of using, applying the protection level agreement to patching. So the metrics that we are measuring here is the average number of days to patch cloud systems. So the, for example, uh, for the scope of consumer markets, we, um, we have different criticality. We have the cloud systems with different criticality. So for critical system, we have set up uh, 35 days to, to patch. At the end of the first cycle, what we have observed is, is actually 40, 40 days that requires to patch that systems. Then there is a decision available for, for between, you know, to, to be discussed between the security team and the business leaders. The question is, do we increase the security budget to cope with that five days um, of delays? Or do we adjust the protection level agreement to 35 days? by just accepting the risk. So that is the conversation between the security team and the business. Um, I hope you get the idea of how the protection level agreement works. OK, finally. <laughs> so I would like to share a few, uh, a few couple of um, stories of my, from my past projects, where the metrics has been established, and they have helped my clients to communicate risk so um, I recently worked on a project for my clients in the utility sector. Uh, the company is migrating to the cloud, and they operate a different market globally. The thing here is that they are struggle to identify the KPIs. They have defined 70 metrics, probably just like many of the other companies as well, um, but they, they, could, they could not identify the one that can be presented to the, to the board. And another problem with them is the, is the vulnerability management. So this is a pain point because, um, because they don't have automation and the ownership of the resources have slowed down the remediation process and the team cannot prioritize the remediation as well. So these are the two main problems that we need to solve here. So on this page here, I'm going to show you some of the examples of the metrics that you might think are common in any business, that because we all track them. But those numbers might not be great, uh, great for presenting to the board because they are not action-driven. 
dot. So these are my metrics. That's R. Okay, so let me talk about some of them. So counting the number of vulnerabilities and instance and alerts review what is the, our threat landscape. But it doesn't tell us how secure the system is and how well the organization is protected. So if we categorize the instance in terms of type of attack, it might make sense. And another example is the vulnerability metrics, which is focused on the CVSS-based uh, scoring. I hope every one of you know about CVSS because we all use that in our vulnerability management system. So, um, so, so the thing about it is it doesn't tell you how, um, how likely the vulnerability is going to be exploited. So that is the gap. In a sense, this metric doesn't reveal the underlying risk or the true effectiveness of the security controls. So what we have done here, so these are the final six, final six um, metrics that we have defined for our, our clients. So I won't work through each of them, but it's just for you to have a look. Um, so what we did here, this is how we, how we achieve um, to, 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 to come up with those metrics. So we asked the company, what, what is the story that your security team wants to share with your business leaders? So we talk about, we, 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 we spoke with the business stakeholders and we understood the business prioritization um, and the risk tolerance level. And we, we, know that, um, we know that some of the metrics are not fit for purpose. And we also want the boards to uh, gain visibility on how cloud security posture change over time. So by tracking the CSPN score, um, you all know CSPN? Yeah, the cloud, cloud security posture management scores and the compliance score change over time could give a clear snapshot of that. Um, and the targets were different for each line of business. So by using PLA, we can define the protection level for each different business area. And we also set a baseline of 60% so they have something to, as a minimum to align with. For example, if they have a, a, a market that um, requires less security protection, that the target will probably be 70% instead of 80. So it's a choice between, you know, between the, it's, it's a choice, it's a choice between what you need and what the protection you want. Another thing that I want to talk about here is that we have adopted a uh, approach which is called exploit a prediction score technique. So we use that to uh, prioritize the remediation effort. For example, in this case, we have used that to define the, um, the, the, uh, the coverage of the patching. So we don't patch everything. We patch the one that has, uh, has more uh, has more likelihood to get exploited. So I'm going to talk about that uh, in a minute. This is our second use case. Um, so this one is very different to the one before because it's operating in a highly regulated environment. They have experienced a few instances uh, within a year. So that is, the, the, that is their pain point. They don't, they don't know you know, how to track those, those instances. And another problem is that um, although they, did, uh, they have embraced a DevOps culture, but they don't know how to establish the KPIs and metrics. They don't have metrics at all. They are tracking data. They, they have so much data out, out of the environment but uh, they want to identify the way where they can actually make sense of those metrics. So these are the metrics that we propose for them. So when choosing the metrics, we think about the data that may come out from the processes that are connected to the delivery pipe pipelines, for instance. How does instance response um, process of the company get involved? Are there any data elements that could fit into our measurements of the security posture? Things like that. Because they have adopted the shiftless approach, which we recommended. So we 
encourage them to implement automatic security tests in the pipeline. So it's essential to track that as well. Um, so these metrics also measure the effectiveness of their DevOps security pipelines. Um, we also use the infrastructure's code uh, coverage as one coverage rate as one of the metrics. So this allows the company to understand how much uh, infrastructure that they, um, they have covered and track against the security policies. Um, so the results here is, I would like to highlight some of the results. One of the results is collaborations. So developers have become more pro proactive, sorry, I'm looking at the time, proactive in identifying and ad addressing the security issues, while security team have gained more understanding of the development workflow. So this is what we're trying to do. And another thing is that we have been able to monitor the cost of fixing the bugs later in the pipelines, which also further demonstrating it's more expensive to, to fix your bugs in, later in the pipeline. So those metrics allowed us to identify those bottle, bottlenecks and those pain points. So they can deploy the tools to, to, to resolve that. So that, so that is the vulnerability prioritization um, approach that I mentioned before. So it's, uh, it's a prob probability between zero to one. It's a score and it used to, um, yeah, it used to identify what is your, what is your acceptable level of um, likelihood. So it's a choice between the courage and the efficiency. And however, this approach is not perfect because you, you will get different scores over time and it changes as the threat data emerges. So um, I, I would say that this technique should be, used in, should be used in combination with the CVSS score um, to, to build a more effective vulnerability management program. So on the board here, I've got an example of how to adopt the EPSS with your KPI. For example, time to patch. Instead of only focus on the high and critical vulnerabilities, if you say that we applied an EPSS score at 70%, which means that we're only going to uh, prioritize those, uh, those, uh, those vulnerabilities that actually have 70% of being exploited. So that's just one of the examples. Okay, benchmarking is also an important step in establishing your metric program. Um, so on the page here, I've got some reference tools for you to, to, you know, to dive into. Um, but it, is, it can be useful to guide your KPI. It's also the target, and it also provides multiple ways to benchmark your KPIs as well. Um, I hope they could be helpful. Um, so on the page here, I only have some tools that, you know, to the best of my knowledge, that can collect your metrics. I will not go down and, you know, any of them for the time being. The, however, the, the thing I would like to mention is that building your automation is very critical for um, having an efficient metrics program. Because, for example, you can, for, for example, like the time to remediate, you can use the time indicator to identify when the vulnerability first detected in the system and when this has been fixed. And then you can build a script to actually calculate that. So these are the things, well, I'm not gonna demonstrate that in my talk, but that's something that you can explore into as well. This is just some of the tools available in the market that I think um, could be recommended to check out. Um, you can also check out the cloud native landscape um, websites that I drop in the bottom here for other tools in the open, in the open source area. So these are the key takeaways. Um, so KPI is not just for security team. They are uh, also business decisions. Um, bear that in mind, please, uh, because align, align your metrics with your organization's specific goals and risk tolerance is very critical. And there's no one-size-fits-all solution. 
um, customize your metrics to your unique environment. Also, recommending, I would recommend to use a protection level agreement to shift your responsibility from, from security or developer to the organization's business decision maker, like your board. Yeah. And your, your metrics should also tell a story about your security posture and progress over time. Um, and also, don't lose in the, in the numbers. Look for trends, patterns, and actionable insights. And you can start with something small and focus on the essential. Just choose the key, a few key metrics to start with and have which have the biggest impact in your, in your uh, actions, in, in your outcomes, and build from there. And finally, but not least, is please break down the silo. You don't want to work in isolated. I mean, security team should collaborate with, with your developers. I think that is, everyone knows that, but it's difficult to achieve that, I know. And there's no perfect metrics, it's just about what matters. I think that's everything. Any questions? Uh, if I get your question, you're asking how can we, how how can we use the the CSPN score as a KPI? Is that what, you, what you're asking? Oh, so you use so that score is a correlation between the data of different data. So you normally get that when you have a CSPN tool. Does that answer your question? For example, Defender for Cloud in Azure. So if you use Defender for Cloud, you probably know that there is a secure score. That is one of the CSPN scores. So it's, it's calculated based on different elements, based on the risk, based on the type of the, uh, cloud, the cloud access or resources that you're evaluating. And it assess it over time and come up with that score. So that score can be something to use as a KPI because it shows the posture of your security environment, your, your, your cloud environment, sorry. If that just answers your question. So when you see the score, I choose to use SOP. That's, that's correct. Cloud security posture management tool. Yeah, it's vendor specific, but it's not really vendor specific. You, you also get that with other more mutual vendor uh, type of like Sophos. Yeah, there, there are a lot of CSPN offerings out there. I mean, pay or unpay, depending on your liking and depending on the feature that you want. Defendable Cloud, Security Hub in AWS. Yes. No, no worries. Um, yeah, if you don't know about CSPN, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to understand. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I, I had a, yeah, so here on this page. So, Myself, I use Power BI because it's, it's, it's Azure, um, and I used to work for Microsoft, and my customers are using Azure, and not Azure, but Microsoft product. Um, but I think I, I think the Tableau is also something something um, that's also recommended by some of my customers as well. But um, Power BI is something you can visualize your. Uh, metrics and colorate them. Well, we not visual, not colorate them, but visualize them. Any other questions? Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you. Well, if uh, if you have any questions, any more questions, want to discuss with me, or thinking that my presentations have some errors, just let me know. <laughs>